Hello, everyone, and welcome to New Consciousness Review. I'm Miriam Knight, and our guest today is James Maberly. James is an artist, a social entrepreneur, and a writer. He was born in Kenya and brought up in Zimbabwe. He served in the British Army and returned to Africa to work. After eight years, he left Zimbabwe to study art in the UK and started a charity called the Zimbabwe Agricultural Welfare Trust in response to some of the more draconian measures imposed by the government. James lives in the UK with his wife, and his latest book is called Why Follow Rules? Trust Your Intuition. It's a guide who for those who may find themselves in the kind of circumstances that they need to change and to get a new perspective on life. James, I'm delighted you could join us. Welcome. Uh, Thank you very much for having me. James, tell me, you sound like you are a man on a mission. What was your purpose in writing this book? Well, I think... uh, when I started writing the book, it was because I had recognized that I was not listening to my own intuition. As an artist, I was simply following a system. In other words, uh, I knew certain bits of work would sell, and so I was working on that uh, direction. But in the process of doing that, it may sound sensible because you're getting sales, but it's soulless. You're getting nothing out of it. And I realized I wasn't listening to those wonderful intuitive ideas which were popping into my mind on a constant basis. I was letting them go by. When I started practicing in the studio, doing what I call intuitive art, I was amazed at what I was producing and really excited. So I did more and amazed myself further. And then I told other people about it. And then I started running courses on how to Uh, do intuitive art. And that inspired me to write this book because I realized that the reason we don't listen to our intuition is because we're so tied to the rules and structures that we have found ourselves in and absorbed and decided to follow. And many of those rules may sound terribly sensible, like, for example, it's a good idea to drive on the left-hand side of the road if you're in the States, the right-hand side of the road if you're in the UK. Um, They're sensible rules, but there are a lot of rules which we have, which we fit into, which are really there in some way to control us. And we feel controlled. And what I wanted to do was to say to people, you don't always have to follow these rules. You can rewrite your own rule book. That's really what it was about. Obviously, there are some rules that are, as you point out, required for an orderly society. Where do you draw the line? The sensible aspect of this is to look at it in uh, the way of the sort of daily rules that you follow. Now, if we tend to wear clothes that everybody else is wearing. We follow fashion. That is a kind of a rule we've clicked into. We tend to follow what our teachers have told us at school. Uh, We tend to follow what our parents have said to us in the past. Now, I'm not saying what the parents have said isn't good, but some of it might be slightly misguided. Uh, What I mean is that, for example, if... um, your parents are very, say, for example, very deeply religious in some particular area, that they may lean you towards that. But it might not be your choice that you feel you ought to go down that route because that's what your family does. On the other hand, it, anyway, carry on. Um, It reminds me of uh, Don Miguel Ruiz's uh, comments about uh, childhood, that we try to domesticate our children, that we we do it from the best of motives. Obviously, we want them to, quote, get on in life, unquote, or get along in life. And 
what you described as an artist, um, feeling that you were kind of selling out by just focusing on art that sold, I think is a kind of a general malaise that more and more people in society are feeling. They're feeling drained. They're feeling exploited by their work. They're feeling no more juice in their lives and dried out. So your book is an antidote, or, or anyway, the account of your antidote to this um, uh, desire to put us into boxes. One of the things that you ask, you, you have these eight very useful questions, is do you really know who you are? How do we go about finding out who we really are aside from what we do and, and what traditions we follow or religions we fit into? I think the very first thing is to recognize that there are essentially two parts to you. The first is what I call the egoical self. Um, and that, for example, if you look into psychology, uh, there's a huge amount that's been written about that. And it's, it's, it's the area of you, your, uh, the part of you <clears throat> that needs recognition, that needs to be me. I want to be recognized for who I am. Um, and that has a great, it's a very useful part of our psyche. But it isn't the only part. The other part is essentially what I call your heart space or the intuitive self. <clears throat> it is where you link with what I call the universe. There is another part of you which is quiet, which is not affected by the ego at all. Let me give you an example. If I've just had an argument with somebody <clears throat> and I'm walking on a walk and I'm thinking, hmm, I'm furious. Why did I say that? Why did he say that? And you can feel yourself getting really annoyed about it. And you then take a couple of deep breaths and you say, let's just separate from this. I'm too involved. And you take two or three deep breaths. And as you calm down, there's a little voice which says to you really quietly, doesn't matter. Is this important? And that's the other side of you. And it's awfully quiet. And most of us miss it completely. So the first thing, the first step for me is recognizing that that is there. And it's not just an occasional whim that comes in. It is constantly with you. But the ego is very loud. It has little flags which is constantly waving to get your attention. Um, and you respond very easily to different situations. Like, for example, somebody says something that irritates you. You feel irritation instantly. Mm. And those are the moments when your ego kicks in. But if you can just hold fire, take two or three deep breaths, let that separate from you. Look at it, keep it to one side, and you'll hear this other voice. And it'll say, just listen, or don't worry about it. It's okay. It really doesn't matter. Those are the two sides that I think are important for us to understand. And I think, sorry. Uh, Carry I on. I going to say, the, one of the things that I think is so important is that uh, we have experiences all through our lives, okay? And they inform us of who we are as far as the ego is concerned. So let's, for example, say when you're very young, you have uh, some nice experiences with your parents, so you feel good and you feel bad about certain things. If you go to school, you get uh, uh, different challenges with children and you, know, you feel good, you're not good at this, you're very good at that. And all of those things build up into what I call the filter, or like little pegs in a, in a board. And each peg goes in, and it, you have millions and millions of experiences. Um, and they have a little, uh, if you like, a little judgment written on that peg. And I like to think that that board with all those pegs slots into the back of your head. And it is the filter to every bit of information that comes into your, into your brain. So, 
as somebody says something to you, the way you respond to it and the way I respond to it will be very different based on the filter of our experiences through our lives. And that affects our egoical response. But our intuitive response is always separate and always completely different. So there well, you are. Well, certainly my, my husband is a professional hypnotherapist and he deals with the, uh, the havoc wreaked by the ego's absorption of uh, other people's judgments over time um, that then get uh, really implanted in the, in the subconscious. So if these, these impressions, even though you're calling it the egoic self, are actually implanted in the subconscious um, and our intuitive self, uh, presumably, is also lurking in the subconscious. I mean, how do we sort things out? How do we start reacting to the world spontaneously? I think the thing is that uh, your spontaneous reaction that uh, we generally always feel as uh, people is the egoical response. That's how we generally respond to things. Um, but uh, when you sit back and take a few deep breaths and relax and just ease yourself away from that egoical reaction, you will find you have a different perception of things. It's like, I don't know if you've had a situation where uh, you might be sitting with your friends discussing various things uh, and you feel you can let your hair down and away you go and you get very excited or maybe you get uh, angry or whatever the point is, the discussion's free and open because you feel you are happy and uh, uh, free to discuss within that group of people. Now, take yourself out. I have now asked you to come because you are, in my view, a wise person to come and sit and talk to some of my friends about some of the issues which, funnily enough, you were discussing with your friends some days ago. When you sit and discuss them with us, you'll have generally a different perception because you'll be also working from your intuitive self because you'll have the egoical self which is saying, yes, here I am, I am this special person. But you will have taken on this slightly different role. And as a consequence, the information you give will be slightly different. And I think it's the wrong word, but I think you know what I mean. It's measured as opposed to just spontaneous. And I think that, in essence is how we can use it on a day-to-day -day basis, but we don't recognize it as such. And as a consequence, uh, it just happens. It's when you start recognizing the difference between the two that you have a greater access to the intuitive self, because you know it's there, and you know it can help. Mm. You have a wonderful quote from Picasso that says, once I drew like R Raphael, but it took me all of my life to learn how to draw like a child. So that's presumably his getting in touch with his intuitive self. I, I think we have a problem with the word spontaneous because most pe many people, or certainly I, associate the word spontaneous with my intuition, whereas you're kind of associating it with learned knee-jerk reactions. Uh, yes, yeah, uh, that's exactly right. So we're obviously seeing it slightly differently. The mm -hmm. thing is that um, uh, Picasso, I think, is, is, is a classic example of somebody who had this extraordinary skill. Um, uh, and uh, But once he got there, once he knew it, he got to a point where he, where was he going to go from here? So he then allowed himself to explore. And funnily enough, he's one of the few artists who has been incredibly successful, who has done such an incredibly broad spectrum of work. Most people, uh, you know, get good in one particular area and they tend to follow along that particular route. And oddly, if uh, observers are watching them and they go and do something else, you know, they'll say, oh, well, he's going off his normal route, you know, I'm not quite sure that's going to be as good as the, as the previous stuff. But Casso didn't have any of that criticism. He could do anything. And he did it well.
I remember seeing a retrospective exhibit of Picasso many decades ago, and I really was astonished at the the uh, draftsmanship, the brilliance of his early work that I had never associated with Picasso. Um, and, you know, just watching his evolution, it's like, okay, been there, done that. Now, where can I go? How can I grow? And, you know, just his probing out into different forms of expression was very fascinating. And that's what you're suggesting here, that we need to free ourselves to probe forms of expression that really um, tap into our inner core, our inner being. <clears throat> that's exactly right. And, um, uh, you know, for example, if one can take it back to art for a second, um, the way I do my intuitive drawing um, is instead of... Uh, having a pencil or a piece of charcoal or something that you now have a history of being taught in, whether it's at school at the beginning with crayons um, or whether it's at art college where they say you must do it this way, you must do it that way. Um, what I did was I just put a square of white paper on the floor and I surrounded it with twigs, um, leaves, ash, mud, you name it, all the various things I sort of gathered uh, from outside, bits of barbed wire, um, twigs, you know, you name it. It was all lying up and stones. And what I did was I simply picked up a random object and I spun myself around two or three times and dropped it on the paper. Where it lands and stops instantly tells you a story. Intuitively, it gives you some sens sensorial responses. Um, and in that moment, without thinking about it, you reach for whatever it's suggesting you should do. Now, in my case, it might be a feather. So I pick a feather up and put that on, 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 on the paper. Um, and that then informs me about something else. And then I'll pick something else up. Um, what I've said to people is if you are hesitant for a moment and you're not sure what to do, then pick anything up randomly, spin a couple of times and drop that on the paper. And now the two of them start informing you. And what I found was that without applying thought to it, because this is where it starts, you start getting um, too involved. Is this good enough? Would that look right there, etc.? You're not being intuitive anymore. You have to put these things down quickly and just let it happen. And oddly, it tells you, it certainly tells me, stop, you've done enough. And that I've always found uh, quite extraordinary. For some people, it doesn't happen quite as easily. And maybe, uh, you know, I've been doing art for a bit, so maybe uh, that's something I've, I've learned. But what it does do is it produces images which are extraordinary and very different to what I have done before and what most of them have done before. And they surprised, these are my students, the, they surprised themselves, couldn't believe that they were doing this stuff when they been doing these extraordinarily tight little drawings, uh, which were, um, uh, in their view, you know, the very best they could do. And you do have these illustrations in your book that, you know, many are quite, uh, quite beautiful. But I can understand the application of this to an artistic creation. So now what we're trying to do is to translate that to the workaday world. How does that translate? <clears throat> well, what I would suggest is that <clears throat> in any uh, situation in which you find yourself, you have uh, normally a, a structure by which you have to work. Those are your rules, okay? Um, let's say you're working for some particular company. This is what you have to do. Um, with, even within that structured situation, um, you know, situations might arise where you kind of feel, well, how am I going to deal with this? Well, one of the things to do from my perspective is to just take a few deep breaths, relax, and just see if any ideas come through about what you should do. And rather than knocking them sideways, pick up on them and then maybe discuss that with your boss or whatever. It's really important to listen to those ideas. If it's at home, and particularly dealing with children, I find it's a really interesting thing because um, my own experience was that uh, when I was brought up, I was, uh, you know, brought up in a certain way, as we all have been. 
Um, and then my own children come along. And what, could, there's no other training other than the parent of the training you've had, you know, as you've grown up with your parents. So I found that I was dealing with my children in the way that my parents dealt with me. And I felt most uneasy in that process because I didn't feel it was right for me. But the pattern was saying to me, this is what you know, this is what's been successful, look at you, that's what you should do. I chose not to do that. I chose to sit back and discuss it with my wife and say, this isn't working. We have to find a better way. So we thought about it and we approached our upbringing with our children, uh, of our children completely differently to the way that we had been taught to. Um, and, uh, you know, you can't see them, but three of them are left home now and they are buzzing. Mm -hmm. So I believe we've done the best we can. Well, now, part of that is, uh, again, some of your other um, points, is the extent to which you will trust yourself uh, and trust your intuition. Uh, that takes a lot of courage uh, when you have this sense that you should be doing something outside of traditionally accepted principles. Uh, yes, it does. And I would say that this is one of the things that <clears throat> not just anyone else, but uh, I myself still uh, have challenges with. Trusting yourself is a really, really critical part of, uh, you know, really uh, getting a grasp of how wonderful your intuition is. Um, trust is e easily broken, I find, when you are in situations with other people who sound as if they have uh, everything so much in order. And I find often, uh, you know, when somebody's with you and they sound as if they really have an idea, they're clear about what they're doing, suddenly your own trust in your, your thoughts and your abilities uh, can simmer slightly and, and you think, well, maybe, I'm, maybe I should listen to them. Um, what I've found now as time has gone on is that so many of these people are simply following their own rules and structures and they're very good at explaining that to other people. But finding the courage to trust yourself is an interesting thing. At one stage, I thought you had to step up to the mark, to man up, you know, put your head up high and trust yourself. And I've realized now that's not necessary. Trusting yourself is actually relaxing, slowing down. Finding that person who is inside of you and recognizing that that is who you are. That's what sees the beauty outside the window every day. That's what's sitting, for example, talking to you at the moment. That's what's brought up these children. It's me. It's not them. It's not any one of these other people. It's me. I've done this. Mm. And it's in relaxing into that, suddenly you find you have much more faith and trust in who you are. So you need to remind yourself. And it seems to me, rather than manning up, it's relaxing into that makes the difference. And yet you mention listening to other people who speak with with uh, authority and, you know, and, and you question um, the wisdom of your own ideas compared to somebody who puts their ideas forward very forcefully. Now, the, part of that is the passion with which someone promotes his own agenda. And passion, finding one's passion seems to be a very elusive thing. You had a marvelous, marvelous quote from Howard Thurman that I want to read. He said, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and then go and do that because what the world needs is people who have come alive. That is such a profound statement. And I think that's part of your goal with this book, is it not? Yes, I would entirely agree with that. Yes. Um, it is finding out what makes you come alive. But 
uh, again, going back to the point that I made previously, I don't think you find it by walking tall and telling everybody how wonderful you are uh, about and doing these things. Funnily enough, it's more about relaxing into yourself. Then when you stand up, you stand up in a... You don't have to try and dominate and force. It just rolls from you. It oozes from you. Your energy speaks mm. it. It's a totally different kind of feel altogether. There is well, no need to force it. No, absolutely. I mean, a, a, a passion one's passion does not have to be loud and boisterous. It's just what fires you up, what you keep in front of your mind like a, a, a lighthouse moving towards it. And, and the, the, the kind of clarity of your vision and the intensity of your vision for you. In, in this day and age, we're so pulled, as you say, by the the boundaries of society by the need to earn a living and so on, finding one's passion um, and working at it seem to be such uh, almost mutually exclusive and, and very elusive uh, combinations. How do we go about combining them into a right livelihood? <clears throat> um well, I think the first the first thing is uh, you have to try and find out what it is that you really want to do. What is your passion? Um, and again, your passion very often is not necessarily the thing that's showing itself on the surface. I feel I feel that that often <clears throat> something is coloured by you know what other people are doing or what. Uh, different uh, things are happening in life and you find you get a temporary passion in a particular direction um, let me give you a, an example just to give you an idea um, in our local community here in, in England uh, there's lots of uh, village halls that have been built in the in the area and ours is really an old agricultural building which is uh, of no interest to people so no one goes there anymore so our sense of community in our own village has disappeared because they all go elsewhere to be entertained. Um, so we need to create something which, uh, you know, provides a focus for people to stay here and enjoy themselves here and build that sense of community. Again. So, you know, we held a few meetings, we got people interested, and suddenly everyone gets, inter you know, gets really excited about it, and there's a temporary passion that's created. So we now want to get this thing sorted out. So... There's a number of us focusing on this, and we're a couple of years down the track, and something will happen. That's a temporary passion. It's not something permanent. But your, your permanent passion very often stems right back to your youth. Um, and it's something that you might have shown a real interest in then. Uh, for example, my son, uh, Harry, who's at art college at the moment, he always took things to extremes as a kid. Uh, for example, when his elder brother got on the pogo stick and got to 123 bounces before he fell off, Harry didn't want to get to 124. He practiced quietly without us noticing until he could get to 1,001. Uh, so he's always been taking things to extremes. So, And literally through his life, there's been this extreme aspect to things that he's interested in. So at art college, um, he started off doing the sort of things that they wanted to do. But he's now doing something where he is examining the aspects of extremes. And he's doing that through his art, through video, through films. And it's absolutely fascinating. And he is totally absorbed in it because it's something he's interested in. And it stemmed from something in his youth. Um, so for me, what you've got to try and find out is if you're trying to find out what it is that, that you really want to do, try and get a pinpoint on it. It's not always the thing that looks obvious in front of you. But once you find that, then try and work out what it is you'd like to do with that passion. Mm -hmm. Once you've done that, you can then start mm -hmm. working out how it is you can move from where you are now to where you want to be. 
And I think one of the critical things is, for example, uh, like me writing this book, uh, you're saying at the beginning, it is a bit of a mission. Yes, it is. I, I think what's written in the book is really important. And those people who have read it so far, uh, as you have in the manuscript stage, as it were, um, have absolutely loved it. Um, and uh, they can see the point. And, but you still got to get the book out there. You still got to get it marketed. You still got to get uh, a readership. And that becomes a passion. You, you've got to find ways of getting it out there. And you're constantly looking at ways of how you can achieve that. But also, as you start thinking about these things, so coincidences pop up and you meet people or websites pop up and um, somebody puts someone else in touch with somebody who bumps into you and suddenly all these things start happening. And is that wonderful quote uh, that I have uh, in the book uh, at some point. Once, once you have... Uh, once you've made a decision, then providence moves too. All mm -hmm. manner of things occur that will move that project forward. That's not an exact quote, but that's one. Which is what we call synchronicities. And yes. that's very much uh, along the lines of the law of attraction. What you focus on, what you give energy to, expands. And you magnetize it into your life. And I totally agree with that. Yeah. That's exactly so, right, yes. So t tell us about your your project in Zimbabwe. Well, there's, there's uh, two projects. The Zimbabwe Agricultural Welfare Trust, uh, we set up uh, uh, quite some years ago, in 2002, in fact, um, when the uh, Mugabe regime had started taking over the commercial farms. And there were 6,500 farms, 4,500 farmers, most of whom were white and they uh, basically just took over the farms and pretty ruthlessly uh, a number of people got killed um, many people got injured and uh, uh, had to uh, move off and find other accommodation find hospital accommodation whatever it was so we came in as a way of helping people in that moment of distress <clears throat> what one tends to lose sight of is that that uh, those uh, six and a half thousand farms employed nearly one and a half million farm workers and their families who all of a sudden had no employment, had nowhere to go, had nowhere to live. So uh, the Mugabe regime was being very clever. It was picking them up in trucks and dropping them in odd places around the country so they could not form into particular groups and therefore be a powerful political force. Um, in some cases, they dropped them at the borders, literally, and just told them to walk across the border and go, and get out. Um, what happened was that uh, in amongst the farm worker communities, there were often uh, orphans um, whose parents had died, uh, perhaps of AIDS, and um, they kind of kept within the community as children, farm children. But once the whole thing broke up, then, of course, these kids were homeless, familyless, and uh, nowhere to go. Uh, and so our focus is now very much on these children. Now, there aren't a huge amount we can support, but we have been able to support a number for the last 12, 13 years now. And the oldest of those are now leaving school, which is wonderful. Um, and they are now finding ways of getting into the uh, into society and finding jobs and roles, etc. That's the farm orphan side, um, and that's an ongoing experience. One thing that has interested me so much about the young people in Zimbabwe is that they have, uh, people who are leaving school now, they have never known the country to be anything other than uh, run by uh President Mugabe. And the unfortunate aspect of that is that the country has been going downhill ever since he came into power. At the moment, it literally is just struggling along. It's as if, uh, uh, you know, virtually nothing is happening. Businesses are closing. Uh, the government is totally focused on itself because Mugabe is very old and he's going to die soon. Who's going to take over? So there's a whole power issue. So the country's being ignored. 
and nothing's happening. It's literally just dire. Mm -hmm. And um, these youngsters are growing up in that society. So they'll know nothing else. And what I want to do is distribute a thousand of these books to school leavers and university leavers across Zimbabwe and say, read this book. It's not telling you anything about Zimbabwe in terms of how to run it. What it's doing is it's saying what you can find in yourself. You can think differently. You do not have to follow these rules forever. You can think to yourself. You can choose differently. And that's really what I want to do. Mm -hmm. In the book, you give uh, sort of short biographies of a number of people from uh, Steve Jobs to musicians to uh, artists. Um, do you feel that these young people will find these examples relevant? Will they be able to... Uh, extract the meaning for their lives and their situation from them? The answer to that is, I don't know. But what I do know is that if they read into those uh, stories, they're all very different. Um, and they're all very specifically different. But they're all about people who have used their intuition to get to where they are. Or as you'll see in some cases, I've talked about people with passion and how they, their focus has created these extraordinary organizations. Um, and the point I'm trying to get across to them is that people who have chose to look at things differently have achieved great things. So you don't have to just fit into what everybody else is telling you you should fit into. Indeed, I think you can make a case um, that only people who have looked at things differently um, have made great contributions. Uh, yes, that's true. That is true. Um, the thing that uh, you know, I note over and over again is that you know the people who, shall we say, the public people, the people we hear about, because often you don't hear about people who are making extraordinary changes. Um, for example, one of the people who I've written about um, is a chap called Michael Young, um, who brought the ANC in South Africa and the Afrikaners together over 14 secret meetings prior to the release of Mandela. Um, that wasn't known, it wasn't publicly known until about eight years ago. So, and one of the wonderful things that uh, happened at the end of those 14 meetings, Mandela had been released and the whole group had watched him being released on television from the final meeting that they held. And um, uh, Willie Esterhase, who was leading the Afrikaners uh, group at that particular conference, at, at that particular meeting, uh, had said to him, Michael, it takes a really big man to remain hidden, mm -hmm. to remain invisible. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's often people who you don't see, but even the ones who you do see, like Steve Jobs, like Richard Branson, like Einstein, like uh, Leonardo da Vinci, like all these people, they used their intuition, intuition, they thought differently, and they trusted themselves enough to make it work. Indeed. You mentioned an author by the name of Marsha Schaefer, who classified people in the world into three groups. She, she said there were empowered people, those kind of on the threshold of between being empowered and, and being tied to the past, and the entrenched believers. I found this actually quite a very interesting and useful classification. Do you have any sense of the proportions of each group in the world? <clears throat> uh, I can only give you a sense, which is my sense. Um, but I would say the, uh, the first group, group A, is a small group. 
it's really quite a small group. And those are the people we're actually seeing get up and do something. That's the sort of people we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. um, the middle group are a much wider group, but by no means the biggest. The biggest is the back group. Um, and if I talk about that, then you'll get a picture of who the middle group is. The back group has got to be those people within our society, not just our society, but across the world, who are rigidly stuck in the place that they are. In other words, they find a small comfort spot and they're not shifting. Um, it's, it's very easily noted when you consider the, the religious world and the political world. Um, in religion, uh, you know, people who are uh, Christian uh, and, should we say, Anglican Christian have a slightly different perception to a Catholic. But I was surprised to note that, for example, in the States, there are 350 different variations of the Anglican community. Uh, it surprised me that you could find 350 different ways of seeing <laughs> the, the Anglican perception of things. So, you know, if that's the way they feel, then I'm, I'm very happy for them to feel it because people are comfortable where they are. But those are the sort of people who fill that community, their way or the highway. And it's not just the Christians, it's the Muslims, it's the Hindus, it's absolutely anybody within those societies across the world who stay there and you're either with us or you're not. You see it in Northern Ireland, you see it in politics. You know, as you'll know, uh, the millions and millions and millions of dollars that are spent in the States... Uh, on the bit, you know, winning votes for the Republicans or the Democrats. I can't give you the exact figures, but the actual difference, the voting shift, that small amount of people who could shift from one to another is in the region of about five or six percent. That's it. The rest of them are set. You're either a Democrat or a Republican. That's where you're going to be. You're safe there. And that's what you want. You're not interested in shifting. And so the wider community are the ones who aren't shifting. They are where they are, and they fall into category number three. Number two are the ones who are in that small bracket, that five to ten percent, who could vote either way. They're the ones who are thinking and saying, well, could we make a difference? Could, how could this actually work? You know, and actually beginning to see a different side than just what's been presented to you. Mm -hmm. That's the middle group. Uh, and they're kind of halfway there, but they haven't got the courage to leap and put both feet in. The first group, the Steve Jobses, the Richard Bransons, the Michael Youngs, those sort of people, their feet are already across the line. Well, what we are trying to do your yeah, new consciousness review is actually i i guess you would say we and and uh, you james that we're trying to address that middle group the people who are kind of teetering on the brink of awakening and give them a bit more confidence a bit more encouragement show them that there are many out there who would welcome their new kinds of thinking and just support them in stepping out of that tunnel. You had that wonderful metaphor of a tunnel. Yes. Uh, that's exactly right. And it's, it's stepping out of the tunnel. And if I can just uh, sort of mention the tunnel, the way I've uh, described it in the book, I've said that the uh, uh, life has sort of slotted us into a tunnel. Now, our history <clears throat> and the history of our people and our families and so forth sends the tunnel backwards behind us. And depending on how far your history goes back, the tunnel keeps going. It is strengthened, the sides of the tunnel are strengthened by the rules and guidelines and structures with which we are, uh, uh, which we are handed as we grow up. And people say, well, this is what you need to do in order to get somewhere. Um, and those structures go forwards because they're, guiding you to go forward. 
The challenge is that you can only therefore see forwards directly and backwards, which is history. What you can't see is what's to your left or your right or up and down. That is completely oblivious to you. All you've got is this tiny little light in front of you of what the future holds based on the structures and guidelines you've been given. <clears throat> what I'm suggesting is if you can release the anchors of the history, your past, release that metal chain, attach a nice stringy bit of nylon, if you like, and move forward to the end of the tunnel, at that point, you have access to any direction you want, anything you want to see, anything you want to look at, or whatever you want to do, it's entirely up to you. You haven't lost sight of your history, and you've recognized that those uh, uh, guidelines and rules have been useful to you, but you don't necessarily need them. You can choose which ones to use. It's up to you. Indeed, it is up to you. So, James, how do people find out about your uh, campaign to distribute these books to young people and uh, about your work? Okay, well, the, the campaign uh, has a few days left to run. Um, and if I can give you the website, it's on a, a website called PubSlush, um, which is like uh, it's, it's a crowdfunding uh, website. And the uh, web address is HTTP um, with your colon and then your forward two, two forward slashes. Then one word is why follow rules as one word dot pub slush, which is P U B S L U S H pub slush dot com. So it's why follow rules as one word. Dot pub slush dot com. That will take them to the PubSlush site. If you can't remember that, then just go to www.pubslush.com and you will find that the book Why Follow Rules is number two on their page at the moment. Uh, out of 42 books, it is at the number two slot. Well done. And um, what I'm doing now is uh, saying, look, we've got uh, nine days left. We've uh, got some funds to raise. We can do this. We can get to the funds that are needed so that I can get out there and distribute these books. And what I'm hoping people will do is have a look, go to the site, look at the video. I produced a video which explains the whole situation and get involved. Become a part of the team. Become a part of the production team. And if you really want to experience it and you can afford it, then there's a slightly uh, larger contribution you can make and you can come with me to Zimbabwe and participate in the handing out of the books, and I can take you around the Zork project and meet various interesting people who will give you an extraordinary picture of the country. And, of course, we can see a couple of the lovely uh, views and animals as well. And what's your personal website, James? And the personal website is uh, www Mabali Drawing, which is M A B for Bertie, E R L Y, Drawing, D R A W I N G, dot co, dot UK. So it's Mabali Drawing, dot co, dot UK. And that gives a picture of the intuitive drawing courses that I run, shows a number of images of various people who've done them. And I particularly love the children's work. They work so quickly and so intuitively that it is a pleasure to watch. And then there's a number of uh, pages which cover the sculpture that I've done over the years and the drawings that I've done and uh, some of the latest work that I'm doing at the moment. So that's also a great site. Excellent. Well, we've been speaking with James Maberly, the artist and author of Why Follow Rules, Trust Your Intuition. James, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, it's been my pleasure, and thank you so much for inviting me. Next week, our guest is going to be Dr. Irina Matyakova. We're going to be talking about her book, Digestive Intelligence. It's everything you wanted to know about the gut and were afraid to ask. 
And now we're going to close with our track of the week by Carla Johnstad called Open Up and Receive. Cara Johnstad from her album Paths X. Open up and receive. Cara's website is carajohnstad.com. That's K A R A J O H N S T A D.com. Well, I hope you'll join us next week. Until then, I'm Miriam Knight for New Consciousness Review. Thank you for listening. Goodbye.